Okay. So my job tonight is to talk to you all about how to think about your risk, in particular for breast cancer, and whether you might be at increased risk. First thing to do is figure out what are the contributing factors that would put one at risk for breast cancer. Now, the biggest factor that puts one at risk for breast cancer is gender. Being female, men can get breast cancer too, but being female is the most ri significant risk factor for getting breast cancer. When you think about that, men can get breast cancer, but being female is the most significant. You ask yourself, well, why is that? It's because of the estrogen balance, the hormonal uh, metabolism and hormonal balance. Because men have estrogens, just like women have androgens, testosterone, right? And men can get breast cancer, but women get it much more often. And the crux of estrogen, uh, of, of breast cancer risk is driven by estrogen. So when you, when you then say to yourself, well, how much is my breast exposed to estrogen? That helps you in a very big group of uh, factors that tell you about your risk. Because the more your breast cells, that breast tissue is exposed to estrogen, the more you're likely to have significant risk. That's one factor. So hormonal history is important and we're gonna talk about that. Family history, we all know at this point, is very important. If you have members of your family, especially first degree relatives who've had breast cancer, that's significant. And you have to think, gee, my mother, my sister, first degree relatives, parents, children, and siblings. Any of those with breast cancer or certain cancers that can be associated with risk for breast cancer, you have to think to yourself, would that mean that I am at increased risk? And you have to think about it. There are associated medical diseases that go along with increased risk for breast cancer, and there are uh, a sort of exposure. When I say exposure, personal exposure, I'm talking about things like radiation. You know, in the old days, lots of teenage girls who had acne were given radiation to clear up their acne. Well, there was scatter from the radiation to their face, to the breast tissue, and that was also at a really critical time because in puberty and adolescence, the breast cells are developing and they're at most risk for damage, DNA damage. So we see that also with things like uh, uh, someone who has had as a young adult Hodgkin's lymphoma and got radiation to their chest. Again, scattered to the breast tissue. So these things are important to think about and to tell your doctor about if it's part of your history. Then your personal breast history, and we're gonna talk about that too, because that can really help you zero in on whether you in fact have an increased risk. And then there are lifestyle issues, which I definitely wanna talk about. Okay, now this is what I was alluding to first your hormonal history, and how much time your breast tissue, your breast cells have been exposed to that estrogen. Think about it sort of the cycle, uh, you know, month in, month out of cycling estrogens, and that's why you end up with your period. So women in general, girls do not get breast cancer before puberty because the breasts in general are not exposed to high levels of cycling estrogens before puberty. Then they get their period, that's called menarche, and from that time on until menopause, the breasts every single month are exposed to that cycling of estrogen, except for certain times. For instance, like pregnancy. Then you don't have that normal cycling, right? Uh, breastfeeding, you don't have that normal cycling. So if you think about it in, in those terms, you can see that if you take a woman who, you know, let's say she got, for the sake of uh, demonstration, let's say she got her period at a pretty young age, eight years old or nine years old, on the young side. Then she had cycle after cycle after cycle. She never had any pregnancies, no children, no breastfeeding and she had late menopause, maybe in her late 50s, just let's say. 
That woman, every single month from the time she was eight until the time she was in her late 50s, every month her breasts were exposed to that cycling hormone. Now compare her breast exposure to someone who, let's say she gets her period on the late side. She first starts to menstruate at 16, 17, and then she has four or five children. That's nine months for each pregnancy when she's out of the cycle. And then she breastfeeds each child for a year, four or five years on top of the, you know, uh, on top of the pregnancies. And then she has a relatively early uh, menopause, maybe 46 for the sake of argument. Think about how many months she is exposing her breast tissue. That's relatively less. So when you're thinking about yourself, just try to sort of get an idea of your hormonal history uh, to assess that piece of your risk. Um, yeah, personal medical history. This is what uh, I was saying you need to think about to be able to tell your doctor when you go in there to talk about risk. There are associated diseases. Sometimes things that we wouldn't, as lay people, we wouldn't really ha think have anything to do with the breast. You know, skin changes, abnormalities in the skin, abnormalities in the thyroid. You might think they're not related. They may be related to syndromes that include increased risk of breast cancer. So when you go to your doctor, it's very important that you give a very complete personal history. And don't just assume that the breast is in isolation. It's not. It's linked to many other organs. Obviously, especially gynecology surgery, very important because breast and uh, female gynecologic um, function is very tied to hormone function. Now, personal history. We talked about radiation, exposure, whatever that might be from, and there's no question that that can significantly, very significantly, you know, these the young people uh, who have uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and get radiation for their cure of their lymphoma have an extraordinarily high chance of developing breast cancer later in life. So it's extremely important that we protect those people uh, and know about their risk. What about your own personal history of breast cancer? This happens all the time. You go for your mammograms and uh, or you find something by yourself and you take yourself off to your gynecologist or your internist and they send you for a mammogram and they say, hmm, we should take a look at that and biopsy it. Then they tell you that's not cancer. You didn't have cancer, but you had abnormal cells. So abnormal cells, whether they're atypical and then the, and they're not cancer, but they're abnormal, or they're early, early stage zero breast cancer cells, DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, those are actual breast cancer cells, unlike the atypical cells, those change your risk profile, and it's extremely important. So people who've had breast biopsies that show any kind of atypia or early, early, in sight to non-invasive cancer, really need to think about what their risk is. Could it be elevated, especially if you're young when these diagnoses occur? Um, I think I'll leave the issue of breast density for our uh, radiology speaker because she's an expert on that. But I wanted to say one thing about ADH stands for atypical ductal hyperplasia. So, you know, again, think about a breast cell. It starts as a normal breast cell, and then if we have a cancer cell, the end result, the cancer cell over here, that normal breast cell has progressed through a series of changes to become this cancer cell. And what nor usually happens is you have a normal breast cell, then you might have a, a uh, hyperplastic and abnormal cell, but it's usual hyperplasia, it's not atypical. And when I say atypical, it's a pathologic diagnosis. And I think the easiest way to think about that is all women are used to pap smears, or at least they should be. 
And you know if you go for a pap smear and it's atypical, they say you have dysplasia, but it's not cancer, they want you to come back and have it checked again. That's because those kinds of atypical cells have the potential. They don't always, but they have the potential to progress on to cancer cells. And so anyone who has those atypical cells needs to know that they should discuss that with someone who understands breast risk and help them make a plan. LCIS stands for lobular carcinoma in situ. Even though the word carcinoma is in that, LCIS, lobular carcinoma in situ, it's not cancer. It's really a change in cells that we know indicates that that breast tissue has an increased risk of developing cancer, but that's not cancer. DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, that is cancer. That's stage zero, non-invasive. And all of these things, all of these changes in the breast on biopsy uh, raise one's risk of developing another breast cancer or a first primary breast cancer. Um, okay. The other thing is that just like with family history, when you have a mother who's had breast cancer, you have an increased risk statistically. Remember, when we're talking about statistics, we're not talking about the individual. I could have Jane sitting across the table from me and we're talking about her risk and she has LCIS and her mother had breast cancer and her grandmother had breast cancer and, and I'm talking to her about her statistical risk. Keep in mind that is not about Jane's risk. It's about a large group of women who have those same characteristics that Jane has and that group of women, there will be more breast cancers than in the group of women who don't have those risk factors, right? But I have no way of saying, Jane, you specifically will be one of the women who get it. So we always have to be thinking when we talk about these kinds of uh, elevated risk and interventions and screening, we have to be thinking about the fact that it's, all, it's possible that person sitting in front of us, no matter how high their risk is, will never be the one getting cancer, okay? Uh, but, but if you have had one breast cancer, statistically, you have a higher chance of having another than someone who is not. Now, we can't do anything about a lot of things in life, and in particular, we can't do anything about our genetics, which I wanna talk a little bit more about. But we can do something about lifestyle. So I wanted to mention these because these are relative risk factors. So none of these are absolute, but taken together, these are the things that we know, not eating broccoli and that kind of thing, but these are the things that we know. If as a group we pay attention to them, we can relatively lower our risk of breast cancer. So when I say relatively, I mean that you could do everything I'm gonna tell you to do right now and still get breast cancer, you could do nothing, pay no attention to what the modifiers are and never get breast cancer. But as a group, these are the things we can control individually in our life and lower our general risk for breast cancer. So they are important to pay attention to. Not to mention the fact that what I'm gonna talk about also decreases your risk of heart disease and keep in mind, we're here all talking about cancer and it's important but most women in our society die of heart disease. So diet. Diet and exercise are linked in risk of breast cancer. Because remember we said in the beginning that breast cancer is driven by estrogens. Estrogens are stored in fat. So if you eat a diet that has uh, results in a lot of body fat, then you are going to relatively increase your chance of getting uh, breast cancer. And if you don't exercise, then you're going to have relatively more fat versus muscle than you would have if you were exercising. When someone comes to see me, I don't care about their weight. I'm not interested you know, at all in what they weigh, but I care a lot about what their body mass index is because the body mass index, the weight is just everything. You step on a scale and it's gonna weigh your bones and your skin and your organs, your liver, 
and your kidneys and your lungs, and these all, things all weigh a fair amount. But what we really care about is that thing, all that weight that's part of you, what component of it, what proportion is all that stuff and what proportion is fat? Because that's where the estrogens are stored. So the proportion that's fat puts you, at, if that's higher, it puts you at increased risk. And that's how diet and exercise are linked. So when people ask, well, what do I do? What's the best way to handle this? I tell them that what we know thus far is that you want to keep your body mass index ideally somewhere in the 25% range. And the best way to approach things is eat a diet that is very loaded with fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, whole grains and fiber. Try to eat a diet that's low in animal fat, that's low in processed food, um, and low in junk food. And if you really stick to that, you're on the right track. Exercise, what I would recommend is not just, if you don't exercise regularly, don't try to go, you know, <laughs> running marathons every week. Start, because this has been shown to make a difference, start with trying to get up to 20 minutes three times a week, where during that whole 20 minutes, the whole time, your heart rate is above baseline. Just hit aim for that. Then, after you get to that, more is better. But that is doable. 20 minutes, three times a week, and a good diet. Cigarettes and alcohol clearly play a role in increased risk of breast cancer. So <laughs> cigarettes, the answer, I'm sorry to say, is don't smoke. Don't smoke, and if you smoke, stop. Because cigarettes actually, in addition to all the other things they do, which are really hard on us, like causing heart disease, like causing lung cancer and, and uh, lung problems like emphysema and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they also increase the risk of breast cancer. Alcohol, don't drink too much. I wouldn't say never drink, but I would say drink in moderation. The problem here is that medical moderation to us often means something very different than what it means you know, sort of out there in the community. What I think is that if you stick to two to three glasses, the studies that are the best studies were done with red wine. Stick to two to three glasses of red wine a week and no more. That's what I really recommend. And less is better. And I wouldn't go, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of media hype about drinking a lot of red wine for your heart. Don't drink a lot of red wine. Two to three glasses a week is more than enough. Um, oh, complimentary and alternative. I put that on the slide because, you know, a lot of people ask about that. And uh, I would say as to that, look, uh, medical, you know, sort of traditional medicine, Western medicine, we don't have all the answers. I know that if I could say to each one of you, just do this and you'll never get breast cancer, you would do it but we can't, so we don't have all the answers. So what we generally tell people is if you have something that you think you wanna try, uh, just run it by a doctor and make sure you're not doing something that's likely to hurt you, because that is the problem. If there is no science behind it, it could actually be harmful. So just be careful, but I think it's reasonable to look for things and to try them. I wanna talk for a couple of minutes before I turn it over for, uh, for the next speaker about um, women who we know have hereditary cancer syndromes or at and who are at increased risk because we've learned a whole lot about this now. And you remember we talked about things like family history which are a tip off. They give you a clue to whether you have genetics that put you at an increased risk, changes in the DNA that make it more likely that you will get, m sometimes much more likely than the average woman that you'll get breast cancer. We know that somewhere in the range of 10% and 15 to 25% of breast and colon, but 10% of breast cancers are due to hereditary cancer syndromes. Changes in 
the woman's DNA, a mutation that makes it more likely that she will get breast cancer, much more likely than if she didn't have that DNA mutation. We know that those mutations, those genetic mutations, are associated with, her associated with hereditary cancer, cause a significant increase in the risk of getting breast cancer, sometimes up to the 80%, 85%. And we know that now we have options to reduce that risk. So that's why it's so important now to focus. You know, we, you'll hear Dr. Schnabel talk, she and I used to sit in our offices in the early 90s, and women would sit across from us at the desk, and they would tell us these stories about their family. And I actually always think about this one patient, Ruth, who she came in, and, and she didn't have cancer. And she said, I'm Ashkenazi Jewish. My mother died, my sister. She went through all her relatives. She had three sisters who died of breast cancer, all very young. Her mother died very young, her grandmother died very young, and she had two aunts who died of breast cancer. She's the last one left, except one sister who has breast cancer. And she says to me, you've got to do something, I know I'm going to get breast cancer. This was in the early 90s. And I, you know, you listen to this, and we used to say, yeah, you know, this is really scary, and you're, we understand why you're worried. She was, this was in New York, and she was a lawyer. <laughs> so she said, I said, yeah, you know, I totally understand. And she said, well, I, I want my breasts off. In the early 90s, they didn't do that. There was no such thing as a prophylactic mastectomy. We hadn't discovered the gene that told us that these women were at very high risk. So I said, well, I understand. We started calling around and first of all, it was very hard to find a surgeon in those days who would or could do it because, you know, the, there was no diseased organ and there was no proof that she had any, uh, that she herself had any increased risk. Anyway, she, found, we found a surgeon and then they told us from her insurance company, well, forget it. We're not paying for this. She doesn't have cancer. We're not paying for her to have her breast removed. But that's where being a New York lawyer came in very handy and she fought it for a year and she ended up getting the insurance company to approve it in the early 90s, and she got bilateral mastectomies. So a few years later, the BRCA genes were discovered in the mid-90s, and we tested her, and she had a mutation. She saved her own life by doing, you know, that. But that wasn't, you know, but that wasn't the standard in those days. But now we can do things, and you're going to hear from Dr. Schnabel about how much we can do and what our options are. It's very different than it was just 15 years ago. Um, you know, I, I just put this slide up because everyone always asks about this in terms of genetic testing. Well, well, what are the issues with payment for the test because it's an expensive test because it has to be, the large genes have to be sequenced and what are the issues in terms of privacy and discrimination? And I'll just say a couple of quick words on that, but it's some, these are very important issues. The financial issues have been much, much easier now than they were when we used to deal with this uh, 10 years ago, because now the insurance companies recognize it, and every insurance company has their own guidelines. You can pull them right off the web, whether you're gonna fit the criteria to get paid for this testing or not. In terms of discrimination, the only thing I can really tell you is because, you know, laws can change, but there is a law that was passed now about two years ago. It's called the GINA Act. G-I-N-A stands for Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. You're not allowed to use this kind of information to discriminate for, um, for health insurance or for job insurance. Just note, it says nothing about life insurance in that uh, law. So when I'm talking to people about this, I do mention that to them. And if you, if you don't have cancer and you want to get tested for a mutation like this, then you should think about whether you want to get life insurance first before you get tested. Okay. So these are the people who walk into our offices who we in general think about at increased risk 
for development of breast cancer. And what you're looking for here, when you're looking for someone who's at increased risk, you're looking for a pattern in their family or in their personal history that doesn't fit the sporadic, normal pattern. If somebody comes in and they're fine and they tell you, I'm really worried because my grandmother got breast cancer at 84, and that's the only history of cancer in the family, well, you're sad for their grandmother, but that's not unusual. Breast cancer is not unusual in our society, right? There are gonna be 250,000 cases almost diagnosed of all kinds of breast cancer this year. So having one breast cancer in your later years in the family does not mean that you're increased risk. But supposing they come in and they tell you that their mother had breast cancer in her 40s, premenopausal, that's rare. That's actually rare. That's what you're looking for. Could, is there something unusual in the pattern of expression of cancers in that family that might indicate that there's something funny in the DNA that predisposes some people in the family to an increased risk, okay? So if someone comes in with a young age of diagnosis, and by that I mean basically under 50, premenopausal breast cancer, either in the patient or in a close relative, it's worth thinking about whether there's something in the genes that increases the chances that some women in that family might be at increased risk. Supposing there are linked cancers, ovarian cancer, we said breast cancer is very common, ovarian cancer is very rare in our society. Uh, you know, it, it, we said about a quarter of a million women will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. 20,000, at the very most, 25,000 in the whole country will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer this year. It's rare, but the gene that mutates and causes an increased risk of breast cancer is linked to an increased risk of ovarian cancer. So if someone comes in and says they have a relative with ovarian cancer, that's someone you wanna think about. Could they be at increased risk genetically for that mutation that increases their chance of breast and or ovarian cancer? Same thing with other unusual cancers like male breast cancer. Obviously, a grandmother could have breast cancer, but say someone tells you their grandfather had it, that's a red flag. Maybe there's something in his genes that made him get breast cancer when most men do not. And you need to look at your patient to try to protect her. So we think about that. Multiple primaries in the same individual. Again, that's unusual. Getting breast cancer, a woman comes in and tells you my mother had breast cancer at 68. Okay, but a woman comes in and, t and says to you, you know what, my mother had breast cancer when she was 49 and then 10 years later, she got breast cancer in the other breast, a second one. That's unusual and should make all of us think, could there be something that predisposes that patient to a higher risk of cancers and that could, could that be passed on to the, the person sitting there thinking about it? And then family clustering of certain cancers and then certain groups. I mean, the BRCA genes were discovered in the Ashkenazi Jewish population and they are enriched in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, but by no means are the Ashkenazi Jewish women uh, at the only ones at risk. It's been found all over the world, in pockets all over uh, Mediterranean, um, Norway, Ireland, England, Sweden. So, you know, it's important to look at the family history and these other factors, but in the Ashkenazi population, it's definitely enriched. This I just put up, I'm not, I'm going over my time, so I'm gonna get going, uh, but I just wanted to mention here, and I won't go through all the updates, but those of us who've been dealing with women who are at risk for breast cancer have seen for a long time that there seems to be an increased incidence of pancreatic cancer in some of these families as well. Not that common, but more than the general population where pancreatic cancer is extremely rare extremely rare, 1% of the general incidence in the general population. So now there is a new update in our guidelines. If you see breast, ovarian, and pancreatic clustering in a family, think, could there be an increased risk of a gene that predisposes to breast cancer in this family? Same thing with a relative who has what's called 
TNBC, that stands for triple negative breast cancer. That is a new, relatively new classification where the estrogen receptor on the breast cancer is negative, the progesterone receptor is negative, and the HER2 receptor, another receptor, another protein on the breast cancer. Those three receptors are absent, high chance compared to other breast cancers that it's driven by a genetic mutation in one of these genes. So those people have to be uh, evaluated. And this is the BRCA gene literature. You can see that if someone has breast cancer, um, has a BRCA mutation, she could have up to an 87% chance of getting breast cancer by the age of 70. And a high chance, somewhere between 20 and 40 or 60% chance of getting ovarian cancer. So those are cancers that we can help try to protect you against. And it's very important, and a, certainly a high risk of getting a second cancer. Let's skip over that. And here, I'm not going to go through these because these are very rare compared to the BRCA mutations, but I put them up just so you could see that there are other genetic syndromes, mutations other than the BRCA, that increase the risk of getting breast cancer associated with other kinds of diseases. So that's just to encourage you to get in there when you're talk, thinking about your own risk and talk to your doctor about all these things we're talking about, not just your mother's breast cancer, but all these other medical issues in your family, because you can help identify your level of risk, and you can do something, as you're going to hear now, about it. Thank you very much.